Good morning guys, Toolman Tim here. Welcome back to the workshop where we build business, create community, find freedom, and share success. It's Saturday morning, which means it's time for another edition of the Weekend Workshop. And this week's video was inspired by a little thing that happened to us a couple of Sundays ago. We were sitting around in the house and our carbon monoxide detector went off. I thought, well that's strange. It seemed there's anyway. So I did probably not the wisest thing. I moved it to another plug, reset it, let it sit there, and about an hour later, it went off again. So I thought, I better call the gas company. So they said, well, you know, is anybody sick? Anybody showing any symptoms of sickness or anything? No, our door's been open, our windows are open, so I think it might be defective. And they said, sure, but we're going to send out someone just in case. And that got me thinking, you always hear these stories, you know, us being prepared, you always hear these stories about people who've had bad times with their generators. You know, backup power can create a lot of carbon monoxide. And this isn't just about that, but I want to talk to you today about the importance of not having a disaster when you're running your backup power through your generator. So hang in there. All right, guys, real quick before we dive in, if you're new, you want to know who I am, toolmantim.co. Run by there, you'll find the monthly newsletter, weekly podcast, social media links, and the shop where I got a ton of different Amazon links to stuff that I've used in my handyman business that's made me money or saved me money. A lot of different categories. We've got hand tools, painting tools, landscaping tools, DeWalt cordless gear, and of course, my favorite, the preparedness items. Anything you pick up or anything you buy through Amazon after clicking one of those links for the next 48 hours helps support the content I create. And, it, and of course, I'm grateful for that. So thanks, guys. So I got thinking, part of this, it turned out that my CO monitor was uh, hit the end of its life and <laughs> its siren or buzzer on that one was identical to a you know positive amount of gas or negative depending on how you want to put at it so there was no way to tell it didn't say on it this is what it means or whatever but it got me thinking part of being a prepper part of being prepared is about eliminating as many risks as you can trying to mitigate anything bad that can happen to you and yet we're so willing to turn around and take risks sometimes to our own detriment or our own safety, that we don't always think about, hey, maybe there is a way I can eliminate some of these risks. When I was in the oil patch, we had the five steps of risk management. And I'd love to say I have them memorized, but I don't. But I'm going to read them to you. <laughs> and they're eliminate, substitute, engineer, administrate, and PPE. You might think, oh, okay, whatever. So I love this. It worked great for us. But number one, you look at any risk, and this is, I'm going to go through the risks of running a generator, running backup power, that kind of stuff. But early on, eliminate, of course. If, if you look at something, you say, man, there is a serious danger there. That's too dangerous. I can't handle it. Get rid of it altogether. Find a complete, you know, just get rid of it. If you don't need it, don't have it. Substitute. Maybe there's a safer option. Maybe instead of, you know, spraying your lawn with poison pesticides, you can use a homemade remedy that's made of natural products, that kind of stuff. So eliminate, get rid of it, substitute, find a better option for it. Number three, engineer. So say you got a hole in the ground. You can't eliminate that hole, but what you can do is engineer a fence around it. So that makes it more difficult for some dummy to fall into the hole because you engineered a solution for it. Number four, administrate. This one's Stupid, but it's not stupid, and it works at home as well. And administrate is about rules. So you're literally, if you can't do anything else to solve a safety problem, you can make rules that say, don't stick your finger in a light socket. And that goes simply of, say you're maybe backfeeding your house, and you can put a sign on your panel that says, do not turn on this breaker. Only dad can turn on this breaker. Or you can put a lock on it, or whatever it happens to be. But that could be a household administration that could save you some problems or someone else some real problems. And then PPE. And if you guys haven't worked, uh, some of you will probably know what that means, some of you won't, but personal protective equipment. So if you do need to stick your finger in the light socket, please wear gloves. Anyway, yeah. So <laughs> if there's a serious risk of fire or burns or things like that, Something that would be good would be to wear fireproof gloves or at least gloves that aren't going to catch fire the instant you touch something. So I hope that helps. That's kind of the, 
the, the platform that we used when I worked in the oil patch to deal with, because stuff was literally life and death. Like we had H2S gas that come out of some wellheads that if you breathed it in for like five seconds, you could literally drop dead if it was concentrated enough. So there was a lot of different controls in place to keep us safe. And this is the same thing about eliminating risks as preparedness. You know, being prepared, it's about eliminating risks that can happen to us, but it should also be about eliminating risks that we can create for ourselves. So let's look at the main risks that we can have while running backup power through a generator. And you guys all know the stories. Every time there's a, a protracted power outage somewhere, you see the local news, you know, Austin man left homeless because he let, ran his generator in the middle of the living room with flammable materials on top of it. Or Austin family sent to hospital or, you know, a Calgary family sent to hospital because they had their generator running in their porch and the carbon monoxide nearly killed them. That kind of stuff. And I'm not here to scare you, but I'm here to talk openly about the dangers of backup power because I think it's prudent to do and how we can maybe eliminate or deal with some of those risks to be prepared and help our family be safer. I actually did quite a bit of research for this video and carbon monoxide seems to be the biggest danger of generators. Turns out that most gas powered generators create more than a hundred times carbon monoxide than your standard home vehicle. And over 50% of carbon monoxide poisonings that for people who get admitted to the hospital are due to improper use of portable generators. So that should give us some pause. You know, we want to be prepared. We want to be in a place to look after our family. We want to be able to have power when there is no power. But the last thing we want to do is create a new problem with our solution. And, you know, we don't want to end up having carbon monoxide coming into our home. So, I mean, the first thing definitely is to make sure you keep it away from windows and doors, especially open ones. I watched some videos from the CDC on this and the recommendation for 20 feet. So they basically say you should keep a generator at least 20 feet from any opening on your home because they did studies in 15 feet, especially now this is going to be the funny thing, especially on a dead calm day, 15 feet, that stuff could still waft into your house. Most firefighters still say 15 feet's enough, but keeping it away from the house, number one, is eliminating the hazard. So why put it against the house if you don't need to? So if you can eliminate it, you know, move it away from your house, get a little longer extension cord, whatever it happens to be, but that's a way to eliminate it. A way to administrate or engineer would be to have carbon monoxide detectors in your house. Maybe even have a portable one to be able to test, but whatever it is, make sure you have carbon monoxide detectors that will be battery operated because you may or may not, you know, say your generator runs out of fuel. Well, all of a sudden you could be SOL because you don't have any uh, plugged in carbon monoxide detector. So make sure you have at least one battery one. And I would recommend one on every floor and near where you sleep. Here's another way you could eliminate or mitigate some of the, the option or some, some of the hazards. Maybe buy a dual fuel or a tri-fuel generator because propane uses, I want to make sure, 60% or create 60% less carbon monoxide than gasoline, which is awesome. I couldn't find exact numbers on natural gas, but it seems like it's somewhere between gasoline and propane. So if you can use a cleaner burning fuel, you're going to get less carbon monoxide, which is definitely a bonus. So there's another way to at least eliminate or cut back on the risk to you and your family. Okay, so number two, the first biggest risk, of course, is carbon monoxide poisoning, something we don't ever want to have to deal with. And number two is fire hazards. So this is the second one. You always hear those stories. And I actually knew a couple of families in my hometown down on the islands because they were more prone to, fire, uh, to power outages down there that actually lost their homes to generators. And quite often it would end up being, you know, the weather's shitty, I don't want to go outside, or I don't have long enough extension cords, or I don't, I don't, I don't. So they end up running it in, you know, a covered carport, which is bad enough, or the one that I remember, they had it running in their front porch. Why would you ever do that? You've got an enclosed engine that's creating tons of heat, possibly sparks, in an area that can be combustible and catch on fire just like that. So be safe. Again, at least keep it 15 to 20 feet away from your home. 
I've actually looked into, this was something I came up with as I was watching this video. There's some grilling pads and things you can buy. They're basically fireproof blankets. I'm going to pick one of those up to sit on my generator because even though the deck that it sits on isn't attached to the house, it's still flammable and I want to make sure that I can mitigate the best that I can. That'll be a way to engineer around that issue a little bit. Now, a few other things. Keep an eye on your oil level because generators aren't made to the tightest tolerances. They tend to leak or burn a lot of oil when they're running. So the lower your oil gets, the hotter your engine gets. So keep an eye on that. You know, you need to, if you're running it for long extended periods of time, you've got to shut it down to do your oil changes anyway. But keep an eye on that because if it gets too low, you're going to end up having a really bad day. Also, maybe look at buying a generator that has a low oil shutoff in it. It can be a pain in the ass if your oil's a little low and your generator won't start, but it could save your bacon just in case you end up having a situation where you didn't realize it was burning oil, it didn't shut off, it overheated, the rest is, you know. Now another one, and this is one that I know a lot of people really, really struggle with because you want to keep your generator running, but don't ever fuel it up when it's hot and it sucks because you don't if you're if it's a cold day out and you got to turn your generator off for 15 20 minutes to let it cool down enough now if it's shitty weather outside it's going to cool your generator down quicker but do not dump regular gasoline into a hot generator if you spill even a little bit you can have flash ups flare ups you can catch a generator on fire you can burn yourself seriously never a good thing you know, wear eye protection, <laughs> wear gloves when you're doing that kind of stuff too. And here's a way, can we eliminate that hazard? How about plumbing your generator directly into natural gas? That's an option. Then you can let it run all the time and you never have to worry about refueling a hot generator. Or propane as well. Again, no issues there. You run out of propane, you disconnect, hook up another uh, barrel of propane. Always ways to look at this. You know. I love putting together these list videos like this because people sometimes watch it and they're like, oh, I know all that. But you know what? If I give a top 10 list, there's a good chance one item on there you haven't learned before. And that's why I watch these videos all the time because you know what? I might see 10 items for generator preparedness and I might know nine of them already. But if I think I know everything, I know nothing. So it's worth taking the time watching these and pulling away. Sometimes I might have already heard all 10 of those items, but one of those little uh, tips or hints gets my brain running and all of a sudden it makes a connection. I think, hey, I can do this or that or the next thing. So I get excited about the simplest, stupidest little things, but I really wanted to talk about generator safety. Another concern with fire is don't use frayed, broken, worn out, or especially undersized extension cords. Extension cords, you know, so you, you, you guys know, you can get away with an undersized extension cord for a little while sometimes if you're using, say, a hedge trimmer on a 16 gauge or whatever. It might heat up a little bit, but you're not going to be out there for 10 days using it. But if you're running an undersized extension cord to power a bunch of heavy-duty equipment in your home, there's a good chance that could melt, short, catch fire, cause a whole bunch. So invest in good quality heavy-duty extension cords that are thick enough or thicker than the amperage you need to run through it. Because if you're going to run a 1500 watt space heater, you're going to need a really good extension cord. And some of them, they don't even recommend doing it. But it's important because, you know, spend a little bit of money up front. Make sure you're set up because the last thing you want to do is get ready to run your generator. And the only thing you have is an 18 gauge extension cord that you got at Walmart last year to run your Christmas lights on. And now all of a sudden you need to run two um, space heaters from it. So spend some time, buy a few good extension cords or just buy one really heavy one and use that for the drop dead essentials and, and rotate in and out. But whatever you do, have a couple of good extension cords that could save you from a house fire as well. And also burns. I talked about them a little bit before, but something I'm going to do, uh, right away and it should be pretty obvious, but I, I'm going to let my generator run for a bit, and then I'm going to take my temperature gun, and I'm going to run around the outside so that I mentally know where the really hot spots are. Because my worker a couple of years ago with a push mower, something you don't always think about, wasn't wearing gloves. It was before we had a ramp on my trailer, so we used to have to pick up the push mowers between each mowing and then push them onto the trailer. And he set it up, went to push it, had been mowing all day, you know that little muffler right there, red hot muffler, put his hand right there, put a perfect, who knows, probably a second degree circle burn right into his hand. He was out of commission for a few days and he was in pain. 
And it's so stupid and so simple. If he'd have been wearing gloves, it wouldn't have happened. If he'd have been cognizant of knowing where that hazard was, it wouldn't have happened. So sometimes we just do dumb ass things that can get us in trouble. So just pay attention. Know where the hot spots are in your generator. Don't put your hands where you wouldn't put your tongue. You know what I thought. You know what you thought I was going to say, didn't you? But yes, be cognizant of the hot spots. Wear gloves. Wear eye protection if you have to. Don't fuel up a hot generator. Don't use undersized extension cords. And remember, behind every don't, there's a do. <laughs> you know, do wear gloves. Do get a heavy duty extension cord. Do wait for your generator to uh, uh, cool down before you fuel up. Number three, and this one is the least rare or the most rare. It's not one you hear on the news nearly as often, but shocks and electrocution are something that can be a real issue as well. And this really got me thinking about backfeeding a generator. You guys watch my video called backfeed to backfeed or not backfeed. There's a lot of safety issues there. I don't recommend it. I just shared my knowledge that I've picked up over the years learning about it, but you need to make sure you follow the proper procedures. Make sure your main breaker is off first. If at all possible, I, I made a backfeed cable and I put two male ends on it. It would have been so simple if I had just thought for an extra minute to put a male outlet on the outside of the house and use a female end extension cord. That would have eliminated one more hazard. That would have been smart, Tim. But I wasn't thinking because every one I've ever made before was two male ends. Now, I have an administrative process that makes my system perfectly safe as long as I follow it. But the problem is, is if somebody forgets some, or if I forget something, I could have a bad day. So you need to be careful. Don't ever plug in or unplug things to a generator when it's running. You should have everything plugged in ahead of time with breakers turned off. Then turn your breakers on once your generator is up and running at full steam. Know the process. Make sure you know what it is you need to do to stay safe around electricity. Before you go to even unhook any cords, make sure your generator is turned off. And here's one final tip that may save you some uh, headaches and hassles. I've seen this again from one of those man has a fire uh, on his generator local news stories. And it was kind of sad, but he said, you know, I never checked for safety recalls on my generator. And why wouldn't you? It's free upgrades to your, you know, if there's a safety recall on your car, we always go in and get it done because it's free, doesn't cost you anything. It's an upgrade. It's looking after your family, but generators have those too. And sometimes there's a short or something in them that causes electrical fires or electrocution or shocks, go on your manufacturer's website once in a while, check out if there are any safety recalls. And if they are, what do you do? Contact the company and find out what it is you need to upgrade because this guy had one and it was actually in, I think it was in the spark arrestor or anyway, his entire, um, maybe it was the air filter. I can't remember. Anyway, the whole thing caught fire and it was due to a known issue that could have been fixed with a simple safety recall. But of course, first off, he'd bought the generator during a power outage, needed it right away, had to put it into service today. So, you know, again, how do you eliminate that? Well, buy something before you need it, check on all the known issues at that time. Maybe if there's too many issues, don't even buy that one. But if you've already bought it, keep an eye out, call the company, get that dealt with today, as opposed to waiting like I do sometimes, you know. <laughs> so guys, if you can't tell, I love talking about generators and backup power. I hope this wasn't too doom and gloom. I wanted it to be as positive as I could about eliminating risks and keeping our family safe. If you guys can think of other risks that maybe I forgot about or other uh, safety measures or eliminations altogether that a person could make, share them. Let me know because I'd love to put together another video just like this. And if you're new here and you want to see more generator videos, preparedness videos, tool review videos, hit that subscribe button, stick around, introduce yourself to the community in the comments below. And guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.